Welcome back, WNST Towson, Baltimore, and WNST.net. In defeat, I have uh, unplugged the purple rope lights around here, so uh, the purple glow is all gone, and... You know, I thought it might be a good time to catch up with this guy. I haven't bothered him in about a month or two. I think the last time uh, we chatted with Marty Conway, uh, Lamar Jackson was wearing the purple gear out in L.A. and winning 45-6, to and we said a star is born, and what would this mean, and what would a one seed mean, and what would an AFC championship game in Baltimore mean? What would a Super Bowl in Miami mean for our, uh, our fans and our fan base? Marty, uh, we're going to have to wait this out. We're going to have to wait for the 20th anniversary of Super Bowl 35 in Tampa next year uh, because this one's obviously iced over. You worked in baseball a long time. You prepared for some World Series that didn't happen or some postseasons that don't happen. Certainly for the psyche of a yeah. town, yeah. this has been um, – we need some therapy, Marty Conway. We do. Yeah, I've got some hats that say uh, 1980 – I guess it was 88, 89 uh, – uh, American League East champions, which of course didn't happen because they went to Toronto and couldn't win the number of games. So, you know, sometimes the fireworks don't light. Uh, that's just the fact of the matter. And uh, as they say in sports, the other team practices too. Uh, and so, for every reason to believe that the Oriole, I mean, the Ravens didn't do what they needed to do, uh, they, the team playing across the line of scrimmage from probably executed better, had some better fortune, and. That's the way it goes. Um, but, yeah, it does indicate, um, as, as you well know from what you've been doing for the last three or four weeks, that the town, the city, and the area was poised to do some celebrating, do some spending, uh, you know, all, all kinds of economic uh, impacts and, and then psychological impacts. And, and today and the, for the next little while, uh, we're not going to be talking about those. So sometimes um, Pete Harnish not, steps on a nail, right? Like that, it just exactly. happens, right? Exactly, those things happen. And uh, uh, I think when you look at it, probably the likely, you know, the most exciting ones are when they're not likely to happen. And this team, had, you know, the team had been trending for twelve straight wins, and there was a lot of anticipation. And sometimes the best opportunities come when you don't expect that team to do very well, and suddenly they're there. So. Um, like the Tennessee you know, Titans. So, <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts of reasons why it works that way. So. Marty Conway is here. He is uh, the good professor at Georgetown University. Sometimes he's over in the Middle East. Sometimes he's just in the middle of Maryland uh, hanging out and watching sports and opining on the business of sports. And I, I want to stay on the Ravens. I want to get to the Astros because that's really yep. sort of you know where this thing began. And we could beat up the Orioles and make jokes about it now being baseball season here and whatnot. But from the NFL perspective and where I'm going to be at the Super Bowl next week in Miami and all of these things uh, this magic carpet ride the Ravens are on right now what does this mean for the franchise here moving forward other than the things we'll talk about with cap space and how the team goes and whatever but they certainly have had a shot of adrenaline and you've witnessed this literally from its embryo, Marty, where the, the Ravens thing took off in 95-96 with PSLs and Promise, won a championship, and then just sort of became this purple tidal wave here. Even when the Orioles were winning, you know, in the, the middle part of the decade and doing well, they never really measured up to the Ravens Super Bowl or the Ravens brand. And the wave the Ravens have sort of waved over baseball in this marketplace. And now we're up on the final two years of the Camden Yards contract that you were a part of uh, negotiating many, 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 many moons ago, uh, 28 years ago to be exact, that w where are the Ravens in all of this with what was an empty stadium for the most part over the last three years and this swell that leads to disappointment? Disappointment's not good for business in the end. For a little while it sells hope, but it didn't do so much in Cincinnati at the end, right? No, that's right. And so, yes, we, we had talked over the last year plus going into this season, and that was empty seats, what percentage, why weren't people showing up? Uh, the Ravens built new video boards. They wanted to compete with the TV audience, all those types of things. And what you saw on that one and only home playoff hosting, which was a city that was electric, that was engaged, that was showing up, uh, that was showing out, as well as all that, in in the sports environment today, that's what you have to have. Uh, winning, just winning, 
isn't good enough. You have to be able to win consistently. You have to win in an exciting way because there are so many other ways that people can consume and engage with your team and your sport. Watch it on television, tailgate it out in the parking lot, then go home. Uh, there's all sorts of other different ways for them to experience that and still feel like they've gotten into the stadium and they've gotten what they want. The second thing they have is a player who transcends the team, uh, Lamar Jackson, you know, knock on wood, uh, at a skill, you know, at a skill position, a highly, a high profile skill position, not just wide receiver, not just running back, but quarterback who can transcend beyond the city and the NFL, who will be a Madden cover at some point soon, maybe next year. Uh, and so oh, you're God, no, of- not that, right? <laughs> well, I know. But you're going to have the anticipation, which is really what, from the business side, they really needed, right? Which is a star, why right? Literally, right? To, why do you continue to hold your PSL? Why would you get another PSL? Uh, I, I'm familiar in, in relations, in conversations with franchises, other franchises in the NFL around the country, who are having exactly that problem, which is that what you were asking people to do, which was not just to buy a season ticket but to buy something and hang on to it long term anybody that's ever done anything in investments or money knows that hanging on to something long term is really hard because at some point you say i just think we can do better with other uh, uh, my other options and so that's really what the potential for lamar is for the ravens <clears throat> which is to have that person that every sales and marketing person every pr person can point to and say you really need to be here to see this because this is a once in a once in a generation type player, perhaps. Uh, I don't want to put too much uh, onto that one particular player, but that's the recipe today for filling a stadium and doing all that. The Ravens will clearly be in prime time games two times next year, more than likely a Sunday night game, a Monday night game, perhaps a Thursday night game as well. Uh, every network is going to want to get a piece of Lamar because that will bring ratings, and they know that. He is Marty Conway. He is the good professor at Georgetown uh, speaking some truths in the aftermath of what happened on the field and then what happens off of the field. And, uh, you know, we can, I guess we could turn this to baseball. And, you know, I'll take my little cheap shot on the radio because I took it on the Internet that when I arrived back from Fort Lauderdale on Friday night to see Camden Yards aglow in purple light, it wasn't that long ago that the Orioles got in the way of sort of blocking the Ravens from having a celebration on a Thursday night after they had a championship. Um, you know, I'm not of the not of the mindset that the Orioles aren't changing or the winds are changing or the boys are running the team. Marty, what happened to their off season, man? Like I, you know, there's no there's no carnival anymore. They don't rent out the convention center. I mean, we've talked about the unorthodox part of this, and now they have part of this Astros tree, which was this vaunted, wonderful tree when they hired uh, Elias and Mydell that now comes a little sullied in some way to say, hmm, who was involved in how and where because Lunau was clearly the godfather of the whole operation. I don't know that it'll seep down to the Orioles or that there's any culpability or any of that stuff, but... Uh, I would say this: Where are they? What what are they doing while Lamar Jackson's taking over the city? Other than painting their warehouse purple and sort of leaving it empty at this point. Uh, one word: money. Two words: cash flow. Uh, I think what you're seeing, although it's not being reported in such a way, I don't think, which is you're seeing what's happening behind the scenes to a franchise that is going through the kind of challenges that should be expected when, frankly, they overspent uh, a, a few years ago, went above and beyond probably what their cash flow and budget allowed, and they were paying that out of equity, I suspect. Um, oh, really? Seeing, R- really? You think it went that direction recently? Uh, it, I, think okay. when the, I think when the payroll got to $170, $180 million in that range, whatever Yeah, the team was, wasn't generating that, right? Just because the I, sponsorships I, aren't there and the way they are I in other markets, right? Yeah, I just don't see the cash flow being that. I think there were some injections from Major League Baseball uh, when they sold ML BAM, uh, the technology part. There were some other one-time infusions, you know, uh, things that occurred. But I think generally there were a, a period or two at the end of the Duquette reign where they spent beyond that, and this is the snapback of that. Um, because there are some things, you know, some advertising, some things that would be cash flow 
that they're not spending, and I think that the rebuild is also a, a, a very nice complement to going through a time when what were your options? Look, every every team has options. You know, Major League Baseball sends each team the same amount of national revenue and revenue sharing money and things like that. And so presumably everybody should be able to spend to a certain level. Um, and choosing, and this is a choice, not to do that, I think, is an indication. Uh, when you say, where are they? I think it's also an indication that things are tight from a budget standpoint, cash flow. I think there's certainly uncertainty about the future um, relative to the owner's health and the family's decision. And then there's the mass and lawsuit, which now having at least know that they're going to have to contribute another 70 or $80 million to the nationals. I remind people that that the resolution of that lawsuit was just up until 2016. It was for the 2011 to 2016 periods that 17, 18, 19, those um, rights fees were going to reset as well. And so if you're talking about... They haven't even started to fight about that, right? But what they're fighting about stops in 16, right? There there shouldn't actually be a fight about it because what they've done is they've reset those rights fees now to the point where the average during that period that they determined was around 57 or $58 million from 38 or $40 million. Well, now that's the new bar. And if it goes up four or 5% annually from there, you're looking at $60 million a year to each team, presumably. Remember, each team pay the Nats and Masson pays the Orioles. That's $120 million. And again, I think their total gross revenues have come down substantially from 2011, what they take in in subscribers. And so the question well, is... Well, now they can't sell the advertising because nobody they don't have eyeballs. No one watches the games anymore either, right? So, like, every part of it has truly been devalued, right? Well, and then also the money that you take in, you don't take in the money as soon as you used to because you're not selling as many advanced tickets in the off season. You're still selling some more tickets April, May, June, July, right? But those are walk-up game day a week or two in advance. What you're not getting is what the Nationals are getting, which is 25,000, 26,000 season tickets sold in advance. Last year's World Series money rolling over to this year. All, you know, a, a lot of coin rolling through the machine. And that's not happening in Baltimore and hasn't happened since, you know, three years ago. So I think all of those factors make their footprint much, much smaller and make their impact much, much smaller. And so therefore they're canceling the rental of the convention center and things that would have cost them out of pocket more money during the off season. Um, they've decided to go in another direction. And so the much smaller footprint and, uh, <clears throat> no significant, clearly any off season free agent signings, nothing, uh, um, you know, so I think I've read that their payroll this year should be in the $65 million range. Well, one third of that, almost one third of that's coming from Chris Davis. So if you you know if somehow he were to disappear off the books, you'd be looking at a payroll of forty or fifty million dollars, perhaps, which would be the lowest in baseball. Well, I mean, have we just lowered the bar so low that there there's no longer a bar for them? I mean, it's kind of like our government at this point. But I mean, it literally, what should a Baltimore sports fan expect from them in an off season where they sign Jose Iglesias? They haven't had a press conference. Uh, they haven't paraded their manager around. They haven't paraded any of their players around. They haven't given anyone a chance to come out. You know, I, I kind of figured like they'd be parading their manager around while the Ravens are playing a play. I mean, do something. Put the Oriole bird out on Ravens. Well, I don't know. Something that looks like you've done something. That, that, I mean, it, it, it's, it's February for crying out loud. They had no offseason of any note at all. No reason for anyone to go to the – to engage with their brand at all. It's 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 really weird. It's like they've quit on it or something like that. And that would lead me to believe the two years from now, like lots of people believe they're kicking up dust about leaving Baltimore because it doesn't look like they're planting any roots to try to hang around here and create fans even amidst this incredible purple wave. Well, yeah, I, I think you're right about that, that they, I, I believe that what they did was they clearly chose to wait until whatever time that the Ravens season was over, whether it was now or Super Bowl or AFC Championship after that, to then get, get you know, sort of whatever they were going to do engagement-wise to do it. 
but you're right. Uh, there was an opportunity, other than putting purple lights on the warehouse, for them to participate in the parade that was leading up to, you know, a Ravens postseason, a potential Super Bowl, things of the sort. You know, that that's just a philosophical choice not to get involved, and uh, you can debate that back and forth. Um, well, again, just for me, I, it's not philosophical. It's are you trying? You know what I mean? Other than putting a bird tweet out on the, you know, on your Twitter feed or whatever, what has your organization done in the last 120 days? I mean, I, that, you know, and I know it's hard work during the season and whatnot, but literally, when you're going to lose 100 games, it's sort of like you're going to have a bomb movie that opens every weekend, right? Like you sort of know that going in that they're not really selling what's happening in the summer on the field; they're selling everything else well, around it. I don't know. It just I haven't seen an Oriole hat in six months. It's just weird. Well, let's be clear. They're not selling tickets to the season yet, right? To my knowledge, they haven't announced the ticket prices. So literally, and, if I go on to Orioles.com, I cannot buy a ticket for May 23rd against the A's? Or, I don't, literally? I'm, I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that you typically they would do that over uh, a Winterfest when they would say, okay, single-game tickets now go on sale and you can buy these. And, but generally, they were still trying to sell, and they, I believe they are trying to sell whatever plans that people want to buy into, et cetera. So, again, you know, there, there's a lot of things that they operate, quote-unquote, we use this over and over again, on the, in an unorthodox manner, that, which is to say when the season's over, other than sending out next year's schedule, within a reasonable period of time, you should be able to announce if there are any ticket price changes, yes, no. Uh, you can sell season tickets and packages, and you can sell them side-by-side, with people who want to buy individual game tickets. So um, they they take the selling season a little bit differently. They seem to take three or four months out of that selling season. And uh, just, as you said, sort of, you know, in your words, sort of done nothing. Um, dude, this is brutal, and- dude. I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I haven't been on Orioles.com in four months. Like, why would I, right? Like, and I'm on here, and they open the season against the Yankees on March 26th. 28th, 29th. I mean, those stadium will be empty on Saturday and Sunday. Maybe not so empty on Saturday, but certainly. Then the Red Sox are March 30th. Like, I can't click and buy a ticket for March 30th right now. Like, that. Right, right. Well, right. who would and, do and like this? Said, what, what band well, starts a concert tour and doesn't have their tickets on sale yet? Well, like I said, these are some things that are uh, inexplicable until somebody, you know, were to them. step up and, yeah. and do a. Um, story on it and get some comment and doing some other things about it. Um, that's the way that they have done business for the last few years. And as I said, I, I don't see any real transition from from the uh, current owner to the family in the way that they're doing things differently. I mean, can that's I ask different. you, I mean, honestly, you did this for 30 years, dude. Like, yeah. what can the rationale be? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not being, I'm not trying to be a dick. I mean, like, literally, yeah. what can the rationale, are they the only team in Major League Baseball you can't buy a ticket for right now? Or is, some, is there some other outlier where I can't yeah. click and buy a ticket for April 14th to sort of make my plans to get a hotel, you know, to come in and yeah. I'm going to go to St. Louis yeah. and go to a game in the summer and make it my weekend? Yeah, no, I would say probably not because even at the time, like I said, the rationale used to be you want to have your tickets packaged for seasons or group, you know, big, b- bigger sales, and you didn't want to take them out to sell them individually. Well, there comes a time in the spring where you got to start taking sections and saying, you know, if we don't sell this as a season seat, we can sell this on an individual basis all the way through. Um, that that's a sort of that's the way concert promoters and other people, you, you know, you scale the house, you figure out how to do that, you figure out how to sell and renew season tickets. And also sell people who want to buy individual seats in the upper deck and down the lines and different things like that. Again, I, I, I you know, I think it's philosophical. It's, I can't really explain it. I can't think of another organization that would be doing that. Even, even teams that don't draw very well in Cleveland and Oakland and Pittsburgh, they would be selling now because you want to have every selling day that you possibly can in every way. Um, again, um, these are, you know, th- this is why their total sales are in the low, mil- low million, l- just over one million in terms of actual tickets sold, um, people coming in. So, um, it, you know, it's a it's a transition period. I can't really tell you what they're necessarily transitioning to, but I just think it's a it's a matter of cash flow 
and indecision. Well, it's hard to have um, cash flow when you don't have your product on sale. I mean, it's insane. Yeah, yeah and the same thing on the <laughs> media side. Uh, you know, they've not made any decisions about certain media uh, components, uh, people, et cetera. So, uh, you know, again, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the family factor and what's currently happening, which eventually I'm sure we'll find out. Um, and that will determine... Uh, I, again, I, I don't think that there's any, not even a half a percent risk that the team is leaving, uh, because I do think they will nail a new uh, uh, a lease. But I do think there's the likelihood that the ownership would change uh, as opposed to them leaving town. Um, I think that's what baseball likely expects. Um, uh, you, you know, you're not hearing any more from Major League Baseball saying who's the control person. You need to name somebody, et cetera. All that public intrigue and discourse has disappeared, uh, and I think really it's just sort of more of a waiting game at this point. Here's Marty Conway. All right, the reason I called you was not about the death of Neil Peart or about brokenhearted uh, purpleness or even I didn't really want to talk Orioles with you until we went into this rabbit hole of I can click and buy a ticket for a St. Louis Cardinals Braves game. I can buy Oriole tickets on the road anywhere, literally. I just can't go to Camden Yards and plan my weekend with the uh, last place Orioles. Um, The Houston Astros, man, you've been real mouthy in the early going um, of this because, you know, you're a fair and square guy. Um, you'd, you'd like to think that the times that George Steinbrenner beat you, he wasn't beating you just because he was spending four times the amount of money you were because he was cheating too, right? Like, it's it's almost cheating built into baseball when you consider how imbalanced it is financially, right? And sort of spiritually in a lot of ways. Um but it's even worse when you're cheating. And um, the Houston Astros, I've read from Astro Ball. Uh, obviously, John Angelos has uh, you know, been sipping from the fountain of Astro Ball and wanted to bring that to Baltimore. And we find out that Astro Ball is pretty sleazy, huh? Well, uh, should we say it's been used in Washington a lot, a hoax? Um, uh, literally. Um, look, it's managerial PEDs. Let's be honest with what it is, right? For 20 years... Baseball took a hard hammer at players and PEDs, and and the media ridiculed these players. And Major League Baseball took steps to uh, investigate, and and Congress took steps to investigate, et cetera. And they put all this heat and light and smoke onto the players about cheating and PEDs. And at the end of that period, let's be honest, this has been going on now probably more than just 2017 to 2018 with the Astros which was you had executives, and I use the phrase because I use it with my students when we're teaching leadership, which is ethical fading, which is starting from a position of where you are, and then little by little by little, you fade away from your ethical path. Why? Because you become desperate to win. And the way that they do it is is you don't even, it's sort of like a magic trick the way they do it. They use euphemisms for, and the Astros did this, data mining, data analytics, et cetera, all this so that you look over here, right? Look at my hand over here. In the meantime, my left hand is in your pocket. And in this case, they're doing something very simple, which is going into a replay room, looking at center field cameras, figuring out what that is, and, and trying and effectively Cheating. stealing communication <clears throat> from the team. But what they'll tell you, and they're happy to bring reporters and writers in to do exposés and books, and Sports Illustrated articles about how smart they are with analytics, right? So what should we say now about the revolution of analytics? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this doesn't finally look at it and say, these people are not smarter than everybody else in the game. They're taking shortcuts, frankly. So if they had all this ethical, if they had all this analytical and empirical data, why did they feel the need to go into the replay room off the dugout and try to steal signs off of a center field camera. Why they need to do that? I would have thought that they would have had the algorithm set to know what pitch is what coming in what situation based on all the data that they were bringing in. I guess not. That's what I say at this point. I well, I mean, not. you know, how do they? How does this work when you convene with the other major league owners? I mean, I saw this in Florida with Bill Belichick after his cheating. Yeah. Man, what a pariah Bill Belichick is yeah, to yeah. literally everyone. Yeah. And I remember uh, being with Brian Billick on a train ride up the 
to New York. He and I were going off for business. I think it was a decade ago when Belichick was, you know, first cheating in the Jets and the monkeys in the trees with video cameras and whatnot and uh, Eric Mangini and all that nonsense. And Billick said the, the worst part about this is it, it, there's this thought that we all cheat. And, you know, Don Moeller says that all the time, that, like, we think all politicians are crooked because Kathy Pugh's crooked, right? And we could say this, and Donald Trump's crooked. Well, these people are crooked. They're all crooked. They're not all crooked. And that's probably the part of the perception that really pisses off everybody else in baseball that's trying to do this on the up and up and win baseball games. And the part where the sign stealing and the brush back and all that and the part of the game, baseball's always had a problem with cheating, right? Like, if you're not cheating, you're not trying being a mantra and then pitching it as an integrity play, that, that that's that's never added up to me when I see these fist fights out on the diamond, you know? Well, in this case, the key thing was that there had something that had gone on actually in Boston, according to this commissioner's report, which I've read all nine pages. And on September 15th of 2017, he issued a memorandum to all clubs about Boston had been doing some text messaging using Apple Watches, et cetera, in the dugout. And he was banning all of that and warning people at the time about the use of electronics, et cetera. And so from that point forward, even from September the Astros players and, and people involved at the at the second level continued to do it. And then it continued on in 2018 when Alex Cora went to Boston and continued there. And so re- not responding to the commissioner's explicit uh, notice to all clubs of, about this. I mean, I've been in enough clubhouses to know that in Major League Baseball, the one area that people do look at is they look at the notices that are produced by the commissioner. One of them is about gambling and other things. Those are posted in the clubhouse. And they take, which is why when Pete Rose had his issues, they take seriously the fact that if you are disavowing the commissioner's specific edicts in certain areas, you're going to pay a much heavier price than, than a PED suspension or something else of the sort because you've been specifically warned about it. And you're right. Baseball and all sports have all been about trying to gain some sort of advantage within the gray area of the rules, but in this case, they specifically went outside of it. And again, I think a lot of this reflects poorly because Jeff Lunau is a former McKinsey consultant. You know, they came in with an attitude that we can figure this out and we can be smarter than you. And as a result, not only are we going to be smarter than you, but we're going to take advantages of the fact that we're smarter than you are. And so I think that's why this smells and looks as bad as it does. But to your point, I happened to see when I was working in the commissioner's office a nose-to-nose confrontation between George Steinbrenner and another owner at the time who had accused George specifically of sort of a financial cheating doping scandal, which was paying money but then paying players, Dave Winfield, others later, tip thing. I saw a nose-to-nose confrontation between owners, and a couple of other owners had to separate them. So what can the uh, uh, Astros expect? I think they can expect that sort of, I know Jim Crane wasn't sanctioned in any way because he said he didn't know anything about it, but owners will look at that club and they will be extra suspicious up and down the organization about everything else, about scouting, everything else that happens from this point forward for the next few years. The Houston Astros and potentially the Red Sox will be sort of a pariah in the room of Major League Baseball owners, scouts, and general managers for the next few years. Marty Conway joining us here, the good professor from Georgetown University, former Major League Baseball executive with your Baltimore Orioles as well as the Texas Rangers. You can follow him out on LinkedIn. Sometimes he blogs and tweets and writes and especially salty when the Astros are cheating this week. And uh, getting ready for, uh, let's see, college basketball. We got hockey. We got the uh, NBA. We got all these things happening. I will continue to check in. I didn't check in with you uh, on the the death of uh, uh, of Stern, and uh, you know that was certainly something yeah. a couple of weeks ago as well. When you talk about sort of the transcendent people in the business of sports, uh, the NBA is in much better shape because of him, right? Uh, clearly, took uh, basically took the NBA from a circumstance where their championship game in 1979-80 was on tape delay at 11.30 at night, et cetera. Shortly after that, when David joined the NBA as commissioner in 1984, he began that revolution up through China, up through the Dream Team, Magic and Michael, all the way uh, throughout that process. And there are very few people in sports off the field that you can literally look at and quantify 
how much they added to not only their sport, but other sports as well. David Stern is in that class with just only a few people, early NFL commissioners, Pete Rozelle, a few others, including Art Modell, that you can literally say, these are people who move the game forward substantially, and you can prove it. And David Stern is, I think, on the Mount Rushmore of that sort of a group, if you will, of people who didn't play the game, but had a significant contribution financially in a way that um, other other people just couldn't couldn't quantify. Marty, always a pleasure, man. It's been a little while since we got together. Uh, I'm sure when baseball kicks off, we'll, uh, we'll we'll chat some more, man. Is it? There's a baseball season this year? I wasn't aware. Wake uh, we'll me. Send to- me a text when the tickets go on sale. <laughs> we won't buy them together. I'll see you soon, brother. All right? Okay, buddy. Marty yeah. Conway joining us here halfway between Baltimore and the world champion, Washington Nationals. It's taking me three months to say that. Uh, you're... You're welcome, Len Foxwell. Nasty at WNST.net. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Instagram, and streaming live on our Facebook as well as our YouTube WNSTV channel. The purple lights are away, but we never stop talking. Baltimore Sports.